Today we're going to talk about game shows, because I love game shows. I love how unpredictable they are, I love their colorful sets, their cheesy drama, I love the secretly brilliant craft that goes into making the good ones. And as a pop culture critic, game shows fascinate me as windows into our cultural history, because they're largely disposable programming. They were made to air once and then be pretty much forgotten. The disposable nature of the genre can make an old game show into an amazing time capsule because it's pitched just to its particular moment. And as you might have guessed today, I'm talking about a particular game show, The Price is Right. Because I love The Price is Right. Because who doesn't? For the American TV audience, The Price is Right is the televisual equivalent of Proust's Madelines. Just hearing that Price is Right theme song can conjure images of sick days, grandma's house, hazy dorm rooms, whatever it is. It's a daytime game show that's been on the air forever, so it tends to evoke a time in your life when you had nothing better to do in the middle of the day than watch a bunch of strangers try to guess how much a lazy boy recliner costs. And that nostalgia is part of Price's appeal to this day, the power to evoke that time travel in your brain. And part of the reason that Price so reliably achieves that nostalgia is that even though, yeah, it's shinier and more high def than it was before, it still feels the same as it did back in the day, whatever your particular day was. How does his show maintain that feel, maintain that power of nostalgia, while also staying relevant to its moment? That's the key idea of today's breakdown, where I'm going to give you a brief history of one little sliver of The Price is Right, which is the host entrance. And now here's the star of The Price is Right, Bob Barker! The 30 seconds it takes for the host to come out of those giant doors, cross the stage, and welcome you to the show. It's a deceptively crucial part of Price's visual storytelling, and it's changed a lot over time, but in ways that you wouldn't necessarily notice, and that's by design. This is going to be a deep dive into The Price is Right host entrance. It's the premiere of a new O-Logical series called Spin Again. Let's get into it. So if you're not familiar with The Price is Right, first of all, thank you for watching this far. And second, here's your reward. A 10-second recap of people who have hosted the CBS Daytime Price is Right. Since 2007, it's been Drew Carey. And before him, Bob Barker hosted for 35 years. And that's it. Those are the two guys. Yeah, there were short-lived nighttime versions of the show hosted by Dennis James and Tom Kennedy, but I'm not going to worry about them right now because life's too short. Our story for today is Bob and Drew, and it starts with Bob. The first host entrance I'm going to show you is from January 1985, and this is The Price is Right at the height of its powers. At this point in the show's history, it's been running for 13 seasons, and it's expanded from its original half-hour runtime to an exciting hour. And it dominates its time slot, 11 a.m. on the East Coast, usually 10 a.m. everywhere else. And the show looks great in this period, too. It knows how to build its own myth. Take a look, and then I'm going to tell you more. And now, here's the star of The Price is Right. And the crowd continues to go wild. Okay, this is an opening designed to make the Price is Right studio feel like Valhalla, and Bob Barker is its benevolent golden god. Here's how it conveys that. First shot of the host, he enters and we immediately pull back this fast zoom, and we feel our visual landscape expand dramatically. The motion makes the moment and the space feel big and makes it seem as if Barker is walking on to this nigh-infinite stage. I'll emphasize this point, the studio is not nearly as big as it looks on TV. But if you zoom out quickly with a wide-angle lens and use a frame that minimizes any visual cues we might use to judge the size of the space, you can pretty easily trick the viewer's eye. Because there are no solid points of reference here. All we see is door and floor. This giant door whose weird shape makes its proportions hard to judge and the featureless blank floor. You've also got this hexagon backdrop behind Bob, and that's another visual trick. This repeating pattern and the rainbows of color make it seem like it goes on forever back there, like we're getting this glimpse into the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. Well, the fact is that hexagon wall is not much wider than the sliver you see through the doors. I added some lines here to show you about where it ends. 
what happens is before the start of every show, a couple of Teamsters wheel this thing up behind Bob's mark, doors open, doors close, and they put it back in storage. This piece of set exists to be seen, and barely, for two seconds but it still has its role to play in this Technicolor composition. At the center of all these visual tricks is Bob himself. The figure of Bob Barker on the screen is used to drive these illusions of scale, most obviously because he's tiny. The zoom out makes him seem tiny on the screen. We know about how big a person is, so it makes everything else feel big. But it's also about using Bob to direct the viewer's eye. Because look, you have this build up, the announcer shouts his name, and finally the doors open to reveal him. Where's your eye gonna go? Right there. And that's the instant that they zoom out. Your focus is inevitably drawn dead center, and they zoom out from that point. It's almost like a magic trick. Look right here, and then poof, everything gets big. Because all these illusions of the set design that I've been talking about are even more effective when the director knows that they're playing out in your peripheral vision. Okay, so he directs your eye here before the zoom out. And then the camera pushes back in before you can really get your bearings. You can't take a good look at how big that door is. You can't really judge how far Bob walks. Not very far, because we can't see his feet for very long. So all the illusions are preserved. There's an emotional manipulation at work here too. It's the drama of Bob's approach. The zoom out reduces Bob in the frame, like I've said, at the very moment we're expecting him. It's a tease, right? And then the camera pushes in to satisfy that tease, to satisfy the desire that the camera itself just created. Bob grows in the frame, his gaze turns toward us. And this move silently illustrates one feature of the broadcast, which is it grants us this up-close intimacy with the object of the crowd's worship. You think Bob understands all this timing? You think he knows where his cameras are? Look at him paint this lens with his eyes, just as the shot transitions. An instant before the shot changes, Bob shoots the camera a little glance. A little glance that reminds you, the home viewer, that you are the truly special guest today. This is a person who has spent a great deal of his life on television. But he also has a strong broadcast design to work with. Look at this brilliant iris wipe. Look at the image it creates of Bob the biggest star in this blinding firmament of studio lights. It's such a creative use of the studio space and of the control room to create another quick and dirty illusion. Because you know, they were doing all these shots and cuts and effects in real time. This is live to tape TV making. It's fast, it's cheap, it's repeatable. You gotta crank out a couple of prices rights in one day of shooting. You gotta make this magic happen on the fly with 1985 technology. Which makes me all the more impressed that the timing here is so precise. Watch, the instant this wipe fades away, Bob's entering the screen. Fades away, and there he is. If you slow it down, the timing is actually frame perfect. The instant Bob leaves the screen, he's already entering this new shot. The direction and camera work is so on point here, it's uncanny. The last stylistic flourish is to mirror the iris out from a moment ago with an iris in, as Bob accepts from model Janice Parkinson his skinny microphone. This is a little bit of stilted ceremony that A, gets a beautiful woman on the screen, and B, deepens the air of majesty around Bob, because that microphone is almost like his royal scepter. So overall, you can see how this sequence was designed to emphasize the bigness of this network TV stage, and even more importantly, to enhance the aura around this legendary MC who visits us from on high to dispense cash and prizes. This 1985 clip we just saw, to me, is how the host entrance of the Barker era was supposed to work. This taping was directed by Mark Breslow, who was the original director of the CBS Price is Right, and I would say the most visually innovative game show director of the 20th century. He not only would have called the shots during this taping, I'm confident he designed the whole look of this opening. It has his fingerprints all over it. I'm in awe of the planning and the real-time craft that went into squeezing every ounce of visual storytelling they could from these few seconds. And to help you appreciate it a little more, I'll show it now done not as well. So not long after the 1985 season, Mark Breslow was fired because Bob decided he didn't like Mark anymore. That was kind of an occupational hazard during the Barker era of the show. He could be ornery, <laughs> to put it mildly. Breslow was replaced by Paul Alter, another veteran game show director with a great resume. But as for his direction of The Price is Right, um, let's just say Paul wasn't doing his best work late in his career. 
So we're going to look now at one of Paul Alter's host entrances from 1988. It's just a couple years into his run as director, and already he's forgotten how to drive the machine that Mark Breslow built. Watch this, and then I'll say some mean things about it. And now, here is the star of the fight, is right, Bob Barker! Okay, let's review the elements of this thing. First, the zoom out, Oof, it's not snappy enough, right? The camera operator kind of swoops out with the camera and then rushes back like he's a drunk trying to catch a bus. No, no, the rhythm is not zoom out, lurch in. The rhythm is bang, take a beat, push in, okay? Bob appears, bang, take a beat, push in. That contrast between the velocity of the two camera moves and the breath taken between them heightens the impact of both. And look, I know it's just a cheesy game show, but you can appreciate the craft that's at work here. Back to the 1988 clip, because it keeps getting worse. So the director, Paul Alter, cuts to this studio light shot way too early. There's no chance for Bob to grow in scale on the screen. There's no chance for him to make eye contact with the camera. You lose that drama of the approach, that fleeting intimacy. Paul, you blew it. And because you blew it, Paul, now poor camera two has to stretch this tilt motion out as much as possible to fill time while Bob's making his way over to his mark. This is a valiant effort by the camera up here to smooth over the blown transition. They're trying to ease this hulk of a camera down as slow as they can. And what I love is that at the end of the world's slowest push and tilt move, we get down there and Bob still isn't there. That's how sorry Paul Alter's timing was. In fact, we spend four seconds waiting for the host to come back into view. Mark Breslow was frame perfect, and here we're waiting four seconds. In game show time, we might as well be waiting for Godot. But hey, you know, Paul added those star wipes, spinning star wipes. So that was his contribution. Anyway, attention to detail makes a big difference in the impact of the image. To me, compared to the perfection of the 85 host entrance, this 88 sequence is garbage. I'm sorry, Paul, it's garbage. But also, it's fine, right? It still basically works. The visual story makes sense. The aura of the legendary host comes through because it's still Bob Barker. And after decades in front of a national audience, he is a daytime TV legend. This is someone who had a star on his dressing room that said WGMC, which stood for World's Greatest Master of Ceremonies. So if ever there was a guy with the ego to really own a spinning star wipe, it's Bob Barker. Hell, the spinning star wipes might have been Bob's idea, for all I know. The Barker era host entrance is a red carpet rolled out for game show royalty. Game show royalty who knows it. And as long as the king keeps walking out on that carpet, you don't really notice when it gets a little threadbare. But then we come to the moment where the king has abdicated the throne. We're jumping now to fall 2007, and it's the start of the Drew Carey era. The clip we're going to look at is purportedly the very first show that Drew taped, his very first host entrance. In any case, it's very early from his run as host. Let's take a look now at the king's old carpet being rolled out for the new guy. Here's the star! The price is right! Drew! All right, so this does not work. It's awkward, it's lifeless, it's kind of cringy, honestly. And part of the problem is simply that times have changed. Host aside, part of the fantasy offered by The Price is Right has always been come on down, right? One minute you're Jane Q nobody, the next you're on TV. And in Price's heyday, when there were only three big networks dominating the American TV airwaves, being on television was a more rare and special thing it carried a sense of wonder, right? Like, hi, mom, I'm on TV, right? But by 2007, you've got hundreds of cable channels, you've got reality TV, you've got YouTube. It seems like everyone is on TV. It's not that special anymore. So this intro with its old visual lexicon of the stage, the lights, is playing off a mystique that the medium has lost over time. But there is a problem with the host too. 
Which is not to say that this clumsy energy is Drew's fault. It's not. Here's the problem. You have this big windup. Here's the star of The Price is Right. The camera zooms, all the same old fanfare, presenting his majesty, Drew Carey. But the guy at the center of it all is like, oh, hey guys, right? Like He's not royalty. Drew's nervous as anybody would be in the first day of this job, but also that nervous energy is just part of who Drew Carey is. He's antsy, he's bouncy, he's anticipating the next laugh, right? This fidgeting he does with his suit jacket, that's not just first day jitters, he still does that 13 years later. The mismatch here between the royal ceremony and every man Drew Carey is pretty awkward. Drew's not the host who can really sell a star wipe, in short. So when you give Drew the star wipe treatment, you're not giving him a chance to succeed. You're not telling a visual story here that fits the subject or fits the moment. The old producers from the Barker era were still in charge for this first year of Drew, and they really didn't know how to produce for him, in my opinion. Yeah, they refreshed the set, they taught him how to play the games, but from a production point of view, they dropped Drew into a show that had been molded around a very different, singular persona. They're running Drew through Bob's machine, and it shows. In fairness, the production team is nervous here too. They don't want to make too many changes and alienate the audience just when a new host is replacing the old legend because of that nostalgia factor I talked about. Maybe, in fact, they played things just right for that first transition year by erring on the side of familiarity. But to me, this 2007 host entrance is emblematic of this production team's approach, which was basically to sit back and wait for Drew Carey to turn into Bob Barker. It was magical thinking. That was not going to happen. They're different people with different backgrounds from different eras of the medium. It was unfair to expect Drew to become Bob, and it didn't make for a terribly watchable show as they kept pretending that he was Bob. Drew still had the potential, though, to become a great host of The Price is Right, and I say that because, in my opinion, he did become a great host once he had a team of producers who supported him. So after that first season, the owners of the show got rid of the old showrunner and they put a producer named Mike Richards in charge of a creative overhaul. And what Richards did was to carefully rework the whole production to treat Drew as an asset rather than a hindrance to this sacred formula. And what kind of asset did they have in Drew versus Bob? Bob was world's greatest MC, the star, king of the mountain. Who was Drew? Well, let's look at the TV successes he had before The Price is Right. He had his long-running ABC sitcom, The Drew Carey Show, where he was the jokey everyman who centered the show's swirl of over-the-top kooks. And he hosted the improv comedy show, Whose Line Is It Anyway?, where he was the jokey everyman who centered the show's swirl of over-the-top kooks. So you're the producers of The Price is Right in 2008. You've got Drew Carey. You've got a never-ending parade of hysterical contestants. You might think, hey, Let's position Drew as the jokey everyman who centers our show's swirl of kooks. And so they did. Mike Richards and his team reworked the whole show along these lines, and that revision of the show's production is the template that's pretty much still in place to this day. So now we're going to take a look at a host entrance from the most recent season, 2019-2020, and you'll see how the visual story has changed. It's not Bob Barker, the star. It's Drew Carey, the host. Host in the sense of somebody who has you and a bunch of other friends over to his place for a big party. And instead of playing up the dated Hollywood fantasy of stars, lights, the big TV stage, the main visual emphasis is now the swirl of energy that spins around Drew. That swirl is the star now. It's the selling point of The Price is Right. And Drew is the hub of Price's spinning wheel. Keep that in mind as you watch. Here's your host, Drew Carey! And say hi to my friend George Gray. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning, Drew. Ooh, I am ready to give away some prizes. Let's do this thing. Hi, Mama May. What's up, everybody? Hi, welcome to the show. Okay, what did you notice? Here's what I want to call out. First, the announcer's copy has changed, right? Drew is no longer the star of The Price is Right. Now he's your host. A pretty straightforward reframing there. Next, the camera moves. They're basically now just two arcs. The the first one is a pan that follows Drew across the stage. In Bob's intro, the movement was all along the z-axis, this way, right, with the zooming. In Drew's intro, the camera rotates instead. It spins around. 
Then we crossfade to this shot and just look at the transition, how elegant it is. The instant Drew's entering the new frame, we transition to this shot. Nice timing there. Nice Mark Breslow style craftsmanship by the show's current director, a guy named Adam Sandler. No relation to Happy Gilmore. I think you should be working at the snack bar. You better relax, Bob. In the Bob Barker era at this point, Bob would stand here and he'd just soak up the crowd's adulation. But here, as soon as Drew hits his mark, he starts directing the viewer's energy back out, not toward him, away from him. Hey, everybody, welcome. And now meet my friends, the way a good party host would, right? And in this manner, Drew facilitates the centrifugal force of this sequence. He introduces the model, and then he tosses to the announcer. And Drew's arm motion initiates this second big camera move. This is a jib shot. And a jib is just a crane. It's a long arm with a camera on the end of it. You've got your camera up down here. And all they have to do is move very little, and this arm swings all around the studio and gives you this sort of carnival ride motion. What is the subject of this shot? The move begins on Drew, and it ends up on George Gray, the announcer. But what do we have in between? We have this dizzy, indistinguishable blur of color and motion that comes in the middle. That's the party. And that, to me, is the essential subject of this shot. The effect of the swooping jib shot is to make the viewer a little giddy. Not nauseated, it's not an assault on the senses, it's just enough to disorient us a little bit. Just like Mark Breslow did with a zoom lens. The zoom was designed to make the stage and the energy feel big. And this jib shot accomplishes the same things with a different motion. A motion that swirls around our point of view instead of moving back and forth in relation to the focal point of Bob. In the same way, the big doors camera move achieves Mark Breslow's old drama of the approach, that fleeting intimacy, in a new way. Because look, ooh, Drew comes so close, it seems like he's going to run into us. Okay, that's just that moment of visual drama that makes us feel close to Drew, gives him that fleeting intimacy. In fact, there are plenty of things that remain the same. The theme song is the same, the big doors are the same shape. This whole little contrivance of crossing the stage to get a microphone from a model, it plays out the same way, even if it's shot differently. Even the hi mom, I'm on TV spirit is here, in the form of the announcer literally saying hi to his mom on TV. Saying, hi, mama Bay! The new sequence maintains enough echoes of the past that when people turn on the show, that old nostalgia still kicks in. We feel like we're watching the same prices Right from years ago. That was the challenge, to play to the strengths of the new host without endangering the vast goodwill of the old show. And these thoughtful changes to the host entrance exemplify an approach that, to my eyes, allowed Drew to succeed and allowed the show to succeed for a new generation. Now, you might be sitting there after all of this saying, hey, this guy is nuts. He's been staring at the screen too long. Somebody ought to ask someone like Mike Richards himself what he thinks of all these crazy theories. Well, when I was hosting my own TV show a few years ago, that's exactly what I did. If you go back and watch those early episodes, when Drew comes out of the big doors, you've got the star wipe. You've got, you know, like, oh, here's our MC at the top of the mountain, like you did yeah. for Bob Barker. And yeah. now you have Drew comes out, he talks to the jib camera, it swings around. Drew's right. kind of the hub. He's not the guy on the top of the mountain, he's the hub of the party. Yeah, you really understand this. Oh, this man. Is insane. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to me about it. <laughs> okay, only so more is informed. my theory on point? Like, have you sort of reshaped the production of the show to fit Drew's talents? Every inch of it. But, you know, maybe he was just being nice. Anyway, if you want to see the rest of my Price is Right adventure, you can still get it on Amazon Prime Video. Search for The AV Club, hosted by John Tatey. The Price is Right special is episode number 20. Uh, but episode number one in my heart. A couple of epilogues to our story. Mike Richards has since moved on from The Price is Right to Sony, where he's the showrunner for Jeopardy! and Wheel of Fortune, two shows that are likely to face their own generational transition before long, which is probably why Sony hired him. He knows how to handle that. I'm shooting this video in fall 2020. The Price is Right is scheduled to resume taping in October with Drew, but without an audience. In other words, this manic swirl of energy I've been talking about, the signature visual element of the Drew host entrance, is not going to be there. So we'll see how the Price creative team tries to fill that vacuum. As for me, I don't have that TV show anymore. But you know what? I like what we're doing right here. And if you like it too, and you want me to keep on spinning my wheels, why not click that subscribe button? As I say, if you made it this far, you probably had some fun, right? Thank you for watching. More analysis to come from all over the TV dial. Shout out to Brendan for his editing work. More soon. Love you. Bye.